Good afternoon. Thank you so much for joining us today at UVM's Continuing in Distance Education from Numbers to Narrative Workshop today. My name is Nicola Willie I. Fenton. I work in our Continuing in Distance Education Department. And joining us today is Bill Shander. He is an instructor, our data visualization and communication instructor in our GIS, our Geographic Information Systems Professional Certificate Program. And really, this is Bill's show today. So I'm going to let him take this and run with it because there's so much great information get out your notebooks, get a piece of paper on your laptop, ready to go, because he is going to educate you on how to become a data-centric storyteller. Bill, take it away. All right. Thank you very much. Hey, everybody. Uh, I am always excited to be speaking with you about data, visualization, design, storytelling, all wrapped in together. And yes, I'm here to talk about becoming data-centric storytellers. What does that even mean? And by the way, you can flip it. You can also say, I'm here to tell you how to become a story-centric data teller. It doesn't matter. The point is we take data, we find insights in that data, we share that via stories and visuals with audiences in order to, what? Enable them to do stuff, make decisions, impact things in a million different ways. So that's what I'm here to do. And by the way, this presentation, I originally uh, developed this for what was supposed to be a half an hour talk. And it ended up being like uh, pretty much an hour. And so I keep hacking it and hacking it and hacking it. I, I speak very quickly and I can do it pretty darn fast, but I've got it down to like the meat and the bones, I think. So hopefully we'll get through it in a, a really tight half an hour today. So there's time for a bunch of Q&A. Anyways, why? Why are we here? Why am I trying to do this with you? What is the point of doing that? And this is one of the reasons why. And if we were in a live session, I would ask you, hey, who knows who this guy is? And most of you would have no clue. Maybe a couple of you would say, yeah, I recognize that face. This guy, his name was Hans Rosling. He passed away about two or three years ago now. He was a master data storyteller. And he was a public health professional. He was a doctor. Um, but he became famous in like the early, semi-famous in my little nerdy world, uh, as uh, when he did a bunch of TED Talks and BBC series, taking data, and doing a masterful job sharing it with audiences. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna watch a video of his. It's about two or three minutes long. And we actually can't play the audio here on Adobe Connect. So I'm gonna actually channel my inner Hans Rosling and narrate it for him. Um, and try to, try to demonstrate the power of data storytelling and why this is so important. So what he's showing is this. We're looking at a chart from 1963 representing how we used to think of the world between the developing world in the upper right hand corner and the developed world in the lower left hand corner, particularly by these two metrics, child mortality on the y-axis, and we have essentially the birth rate, or as it's expressed here, babies born per woman on the x-axis. So we have these countries, richer countries in one area, poorer countries in another area. We used to refer to this as the developing versus the developed world. But as he says, it turns out that this whole idea of developing versus developed world is actually a total myth, and he pounds his hand. <laughs> here you go. So that's the idea here, is that he's trying to make the case that things have changed. So starting off in 1963, they, you know, all the countries were distributed in this way. But as you can see, as time is going by, all those poorest countries, measured by these two metrics, started to look more like the richest countries in the world, such that by 1990, look at this, most of those countries had already made it all the way down into that lower left-hand corner in what we used to refer to as the developed world. Look at China and India and a bunch of the African countries, the poorest countries in the world, have made a lot of progress. Obviously, some countries are still stuck in the upper right-hand corner. Now, if we zoom in on Ethiopia as a specific example, look at what happens to them. From 1990 all the way up until, I believe it's, uh, well, actually, no, this is from 60 to whatever to 1990. But then the progression from 1990 up until maybe uh, 2010, they've even made it halfway there, maybe even a little bit more than halfway there. So remarkable progress amongst the poorest countries in the world. So 2013, actually. And as you can see, just about, they're, all, they're almost all gone from that poorest corner of this metric. Now, you can split Ethiopia up into its regions, and the richest region, Addis Ababa, the capital, already looks like one of the richest countries in the world by these two measures, and the poorest Somali region is still stuck up there in the upper right-hand side. But 90% of the Ethiopian population is right smack dab there in the middle. They're well on their way. And if things continue the way they've been going, by 2030, there will pretty much be no more countries left in what we used to call the developing world at least by, again, these two measures. But not just these two measures, it's all the different measures. 
So the fact of the matter is that's Hans Rosling's data story, masterfully told, semi-okay <laughs> narration on my part, uh, trying to keep up with him. But long story short, we are here because this is what we want to do. We want to find insights and data, or maybe somebody's already found them and wants us to help communicate them. Great. Then we're going to come up with a narrative, a way of telling that story in a way that's going to reach an audience and have an impact on them. And we're going to use visuals very strategically and thoughtfully in order to maximize that impact. So in other words, we want to be more like Hans. That's really why this matters. So becoming data centric storytellers, becoming story centric data tellers, doesn't matter. What I'm going to share with you is a story really broken into five parts. Part one is about data literacy and data analytics. So data literacy. In order to understand this visual, you have to be data literate. Not only data visualization literate, which is like another thing, but you even have to be data literate. But let's think about it just sort of broadly. I see some ink on a page and I see a burnt match. No, of course, I see a chart. A chart is a thing that has you know, borders, it has axes, the axes labels tell me what they mean. And of course, the shape of the match is telling me something about data. And of course, there's a metaphor going on here. Tell me about the severity of weather and climate change, et cetera. Got it. You have to be data literate to understand that. Now, Click is a company that makes business intelligence data analytics software. They did a survey a couple of years ago that found that 24% of business decision makers, not 24% of humans, 24% of leadership consider themselves, uh, themselves data literate. Here's the thing. How data literate are you? When you look at that number, what do you think? You know what I think? I think, holy crap, are you kidding me? 24%? You mean only 24%, meaning 76% aren't data literate. Three out of four, are you joking? That's ridiculous. So you have to be data literate to understand how to make sense of the numbers that you read. You don't just take every number at face value. So data literacy broken into sort of a definition from MIT. They say the ability to read, work with, analyze, and argue with data. And they have some sort of sub-definitions of what they mean by those words. Listen, it's even simpler than that. It's the ability to think about and do stuff with data. If you can interpret, understand, make sense of data, great, that's half. And then if you can do stuff with it, turn it into visuals, communicate it, tell stories with it, that's what it's all about. If you are data literate, you can work with data. It's kind of that simple. And that understanding is key, but it's not just about your data literacy. It's also about your audience. When you are communicating with data, it's as much about them. In fact, it's more about them than about anything else. How data literate are they? Can you show them some ink and a match and think they'll get it? Could you show that quote unquote joke to a kindergarten class? Maybe not to a senior in high school class? Probably, right? So how data literate is your audience or is something you have to think about. And really, that's sort of the key phrase there, really above and beyond everything else. Data literacy is about critical thinking. Data analytics is about critical thinking. I have a question, a problem I'm trying to solve in my organization or in my schoolwork, whatever the case may be. How can I solve that problem with data? Well. I have to identify the nature of that problem. Okay, now I can think about what data is there out there in that world that might help me unearth insights about the nature of that problem. Great, there's this data set. Which fields in that data set are gonna help me answer that question? Great, now what questions can I ask of my data? Literally questions, you know, like, hey, if this number goes up, does that number go up? You know, what is the relationship between this and this? What is the maximum amount of this before this happens? Those are questions. And if you can phrase and think about those questions you can ask every data, which is a critical thinking task, then translating that into the actual methodologies and statistics and all that stuff becomes really kind of the easy part. So data literacy, data analytics is mostly above all else about thinking critically about what you're trying to do. And here's the other thing. Data literacy, data analytics is also very much about visualization. You cannot separate the two. We think of visualization as being, okay, end product to show our audience. And absolutely, it's a critical for communications, but it's also critical for the data analytics themselves. And one of the best examples of this, you know, this proof of this point that you'll see stuff in the numbers uh, that, that you won't see in the numbers alone is something called Anscombe's Quartet. This guy, Francis Anscombe, came up with four data sets. They're pretty much identical. 
they each have an X and a Y value, two variables. And you can see the numbers here. They're all single digit, two digit numbers. And in looking at this table of numbers, they look exactly the same pretty much. Maybe you'll notice uh, data set number four has all the same value for X except for one. Fine. But other than that, I see no patterns. Fine. Let's use statistics. Each of these data sets has the pretty much exact same average mean of X and Y, the same variance of X and Y. And if you don't know these terms, it doesn't matter. Statistics, who cares? Well, of course, I care. It's important. But same correlation, the same regression, and the same correlation coefficient. In other words, statistics tell us these are the same data sets until we visualize them. Now we see they are wildly different. So visualization is critical for you to uncover insights in your data, and yes, also for you to communicate those insights to an audience. So data literacy, data analytics, which includes visualization, is the critical first step toward becoming a data-centric storyteller or vice versa. And there are levels of data literacy. It's a spectrum. Do you need to be a data scientist? A statistics PhD? Of course not. I'm none of those things. I'm like way over here on the spectrum, okay? I'm, I'm not all the way over here, but I'm pretty close. I do light analytics, okay? So you don't have to be a genius at this stuff, but you have to know some of it. That's the basic idea. All right, part two, storytelling. I've figured out what's in my data. I've done my analytics. Fantastic. It's time to start thinking about how I'm going to communicate it to an audience. Great. Why? For here's the thing. Human beings have evolved over the past 50,000, 100,000, depending on who you're talking to, maybe several hundred thousand years, telling each other stories. This is literally how we have evolved to learn from each other. We must learn via story. We are not good at learning in other methods. Our primary uh, method of learning is through story. The example I like to give is ancient man went out on the hunt. They got the buffalo and they came back to the village to explain how to go get buffalo. And they explained it via data, yes, how many arrows they carried, how many arrows they had to shoot, the number of miles they ran, the wind speed and direction, et cetera, et cetera, data, data, data. But it was not in a spreadsheet, right? It was story. That's how they communicated that stuff. So we require this from each other. So how do you get to story? I teach a couple of these things in the class um, that I teach, one of which is a series of terrible acronyms that I came up with called the QUIES. Good shorthand, bad acronyms. Here's the first acronym, terrible can't pronounce it. What does it mean? You're not going to even remember it. But the idea here is no joke, one of the most important ideas in the entire class that I teach. So this first acronym, QUERWITS, it does have a pronunciation as terrible as it is, stands for know what you really want to say. Duh. How can you communicate if you don't know what you want to say? Yes, obvious. You know what though? Everybody skips this part, <laughs> especially with data storytelling, by the way. Everyone's like, oh, here's some data. Let me crank out some charts. Boom, here's the data audience. Why? What are you trying to say? Oh, yeah, I didn't think about that. You must, must, must always think about what you're trying to say. If you don't, this is what your audience looks like, right? They will be confused. They will be annoyed, and they will absolutely be questioning your credibility. <laughs> Have your point of view. Does this mean manipulate your audience? Of course not. Does this mean take advantage of them, uh, tell them mistruths, anything like that? Of course not. You're a data fiduciary. Your primary obligation is to the truth and the data, but you have a point of view on it, or you have something, some aspect of it you're trying to focus on. So figure out what that is, and you'll do a better job communicating. Second terrible acronym, QUIDUS, stands for know what your data is saying. Duh, data literacy. I get it. I got to analyze my data. I got to understand my data to communicate it. This one's straightforward. We don't need to linger on that one at all. The last terrible acronym is QUIANTH, Ooh, terrible, um, which stands for another really, really, really important idea. You also have to know what your audience needs to hear. If you don't understand your audience, you cannot communicate with them. It's that simple. And this is like Corwitz, something people skip. They don't really think deeply about their audience. Who are they? What do they know? What do they need to know? What are they trying to do with this data? What do they expect? Uh, what might surprise them? times 100 questions you might ask of your audience. And here's the thing. Why do we ask questions about our audience? Why does it matter? Well, audiences are weird. Audiences do unexpected things. How would you design an ice cream cone if you knew someone was going to eat it with their toes, right? <laughs> and this applies to product design, but it also applies to communications. So yes, understand your audience, and you'll come up with more innovative, more effective everything for them, including communications. So. These are the acronyms. They're terrible, 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 terrible. But it, I like the shorthand. The quiz rhymes with Y, which is what, is what, what it, it's really all about. If you understand those three things, the three legs of the stool, you'll do a better job 
setting your priorities, focusing everything you're doing for your audience. Okay, how? How do you actually get to story? And I teach this in more detail in the class, but very briefly, number one, outline it. What? What is this, like seventh grade English class? Yeah, I'm serious. I used to hate outlining everything, and my seventh grade English teacher, no joke, like this is like a literal example, she always gave me terrible grades, and I would always skip the outline and go right to writing, and I was like, come on, I know what I'm doing, right, 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 right. Nope, doesn't work. Trust me, outline your story. Literally, put your story in order, put it into buckets, content areas, put them in order, that's an outline. Every time, I, and by the way, I do this on every single, single thing I do now. The outline structures your ideas. Cannot emphasize it enough. Secondly, when you're coming up with a story, you must, whether it's data-driven or not, but especially when it's data-driven, make sure it flows. Stories are just linear things that flow. What do I mean by flow? I don't even have to tell you what I mean. You know why? Because as a human with 50,000 plus years of evolutionary experience listening to stories and telling stories, you know what flow sounds like. You know when a story is a series of unconnected facts and when one idea flows to the next, to the next, to the next. So think about, for example, this story. Blah, 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 blah. Two random ideas. Versus blah, 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 and therefore, Blah, blah, blah. Ooh, that's a whole different meaning. Those flow, right? So we know what it feels like. You must outline your story and make sure it flows. If you do that, regardless of the data and the visuals and everything else, everything else really sort of falls into place. It's kind of that simple. So data stories are just stories that have data as the foundational element, yes. But they're stories. So once you've analyzed your data, you know your point of view of your data, you've thought about your quies, Focus on the story, that narrative, that structure that's going to bring it all together. Almost step back from the data for a moment and then figure out where the data fits back into that. And again, I'm not saying orient your data towards a story, manipulate. It's not about that. It's about knowing what you're trying to say, adhering to the truth, but find the narrative structure that helps express it most effectively for your audience. Okay, part three, design thinking. This is a quickie, right? Design thinking, by the way, is a school of thought around design that comes out of Stanford and IDEO, a big design company, a firm. And the idea is this, in order to design anything, it's sort of five steps. And we use this throughout all design, interface design, graphic design, web design, data storytelling, anything, data visualization. First, you gotta have empathy for your audience. And if you truly empathize with your audience, then you can move on towards defining solutions for them, at which point then you can ideate the specific solutions, so that's brainstorming specific ideas, then you can prototype those solutions and then you can test them and see what works and doesn't work and iterate from there. The reason I like to bring this up is that in data storytelling in particular, like I said before, hey, here's some data, crank out some charts, boom, done. And we don't take the, the moment to step back and think strategically. And this is where most of the failures occur. It's around the quies. It's around the story flow. And both of those fail because we haven't been empathetic with our audience, defined broadly what we're trying to accomplish, ideated and prototyped and test. If you simply follow this process, even just generically, then you know everything you do is better when you do actually follow that process. And it all comes down to this, why? Why am I doing this? If you constantly ask yourself why, 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 as I've already done a couple times today, then everything you do gets better. That's simple. All right, that's an easy one. Part four, design and visualization best practices. And there's a whole bunch you can say about design and visualization. Um, and of course, we talk a lot about it uh, in specifics in the class. But what I wanna say about it today is, for, is a couple of key things. First of all, design is always, always, always about information hierarchy. You're constantly telling your audience when you create stuff, this is more important, this is less important. And you do that in a bunch of ways, placement, size, color, and typography, where things are on a screen, the size of them, et cetera. This is really important, this is not important, right? Big versus small. But in the end, the way you accomplish this is through an incredibly interesting concept called pre-attentive processing. So let me take a step back. Every human being experiences every visual experience you have pre-attentively, meaning before you're paying attention to it. So subconsciously, very, very quickly. Okay, so give me an example. Here's an example. 
If I asked you to tell me how many fours do you see, you're going to start reading. This is text processing. No design has been applied. There's no pretentive attributes yet. With design, in this case just contrast and a tiny bit of color, now you can pretentively guess how many fours there are, and you'd be shocked at how good you are at guessing. If we averaged all of our answers, we'd be like within some tiny percentage of, of correct. No one's going to say three, no one's going to say 100, right? So, pretentive processing. Because I know when I show you a visual, you're going to make judgments about it literally in a heartbeat, at a glance, it makes me change how I design things. I have to consider that rapid response and the subconscious response you're going to have to it. And so my entire goal in design, remember, is about information hierarchy. I want to tell you this is more important, this is less important. Look here, don't bother looking over here. If that's my goal, and I know you're going to react pre-attentively at a glance, therefore I can design with intention to help you see the truth in my data by eliminating distraction and drawing your eye to the good stuff, which boils down to this design advice, do less. If you simply change your default behavior to minimize and simplify everything, you have a better chance at achieving your goal of helping your audience see the truth in your data. Does this mean simplicity is always the answer? No. There's a whole argument for complexity, which I, I'm not going to get into here today, but as a default position, change to doing less to simplicity. Now, what I'm going to do next, I'm going to try to do this very quickly, is I'm going to walk through this chart which is a hot mess of a chart with showing uh, user volume and error rates for a software application. And there's two error rates, the old one in gold and the new uh, technology in green. The user volume is in the bars, and we also have the dotted lines, which are the target error rates for this particular software application for the old and the new technology, fine. The point of this is this, if I look at this chart, in addition to wanting to cry a little bit, um, it, I got to figure out well, what actually matters here. And what I wish I had to help me solve the problem was a new key on my keyboard, like an F key. You know those F keys at the top of the keyboard? I wish I had an F key to help me figure out what to do and how to do it. So I'm going to invent a new F key. And I'm going to walk through this, making one change at a time to make this better. So if we look at this thing, the first thing I look at always, is I look at all those data labels, all those numbers, and I ask myself, do I need to put all those numbers on this chart? And so I'm going to use my new F key, which I am referring to as my F no key. I say F no to those data labels, okay? And so by removing those data labels, it is much easier to read this chart. Do I need the specific numbers? No, the gist of this chart, the gist of the story is the idea. Error rates are coming down. They're better than target, blah, blah, blah. Cool. What next? How about the grid lines? Do I need those grid lines? I say F no to those too. Generally speaking, remove grid lines. You don't need them. Can you talk me into adding them back in? Of course, but I wanted you to change your default position to no. I'm going to move really fast to this. You don't have to remember all this, but you get the gist. It's all about F no to this and F no to that. So on this next one, I look at the axis labels and I say, am I happy about the positioning of the axis labels where I have to crane my neck 90 degrees to read them? You know the answer to that one. Of course not. I want to put those up at the top. I want to make them horizontal, make them readable. I'm going to catch spelling errors. Of course, I want to do that. Next one is I might look at the numbers. Do I care about all those numbers on the left-hand side and the right-hand side, the specifics, 6.5%, 4.0%, blah, blah, blah. Absolutely not. F no. I want you to have the bottom number and the top number, nothing else in between. If you have negative numbers and positive numbers, you also have to have the zero line. But by default, the answer is no. F no, in fact. I'd get rid of all of them and just minimize. Again, can you talk me into adding a number back in? Listen, 3.5% is important because of XYZ. Great. Put it back in there but by default, the answer is no, okay? So then I look at uh, the bars. Look at the design of these bars, the hard edge, the gradient of color, yuck, you know what I think about those. I wanna simplify those at a minimum. A bar is a single number, it should be a single solid design. Flat design is a, is a trend, but it's also extremely effective. I say F no to that weird design. And by the way, as I'm looking at these bars, I might ask myself, why do, what are these bars? It's user volume, is the error rate tied to user volume. I asked the client, they said, no, good, F no, get rid of those stupid bars. It's not even part of the story. Literally, this story is all about the error rate. How are we doing in terms of managing errors in the software application? Nothing to do with user volume, goodbye. Then I look at this chart and I say, what's the strongest pre-attentive trigger now? Glance at it, what do you see? Those thick, heavy dotted lines, do I like those? F no, I'm gonna simplify them too, right? Now, you could say mine are a little bit too simple, you can barely see them, fine, we can have a good debate about that. But I wanted to simplify them. 
How about now all the stupid dots on the line? What do you think I think about those? You know the answer. I want to get rid of those too. The markers on line charts are useless, beyond useless. Never, ever, ever use them again. I say F no always to those. Next up, I look at the two charts. I might look at this and say, hey, I have these two lines on top of each other. Is my goal for this particular story to track how they're tracking with each other? If the answer is yes, fantastic. This is a great chart. But you know what the answer is? Absolutely not. Turns out it's all about where the line crossed the dotted line and when and by how much. And I can't see them when they're on top of each other. Literally, it's hard to read where the green line crosses its dotted line, where the gold line crosses its one. They're all over each other. It's kind of a spaghetti chart, even though it's only two lines, four lines. So separate charts, nothing wrong with two separate charts. Okay, now I look at it and I say, fantastic. What is the data story really all about on this particular chart? This is the rare chart where the star is not the data itself, the line. In this particular chart, it's actually about where the line crossed the dotted line, how long ago, and by how much. So in fact, I say no, this is not even the right chart type. This is the right chart type, a deviation chart. Emphasize the space in between, because that's what this particular story is all about. How are we doing compared to the benchmark? Fantastic. I ask myself, do I understand what's going on now? Am I telling you enough of a story? No. Aha, I'm no longer doing less. Now let's add a little bit back in. Let me add some strategic labeling annotation. Do I need more annotation? Yes, probably. I want the numbers, but only the final numbers, not all the numbers, right? Then I look at this chart and I say, all right, cool, interesting. How am I doing? Do I like this data story? Is this telling the full story? And of course, you know the answer. Turns out, really? It's all about this. It's all about the new technology. It's not even about the old technology. They've disbanded that team. They're not even fixing bugs. Why are we talking about it? Good riddance, goodbye. How about now? Am I happy with this? Not quite. I'm so close, but I want to do this. Instead of having a legend, a key down below, I want to do is inline labeling. Blue line next gets blue text. Green line gets green text next to it. In this case, it's two grays, but you see what I'm talking about. Inline labeling rather than putting things off to the side or down below in a legend. So do less. There's a bunch of lessons in there. We're not going to linger on these. The point is reduce, reduce, remove, remove, remove until you're actually telling the story you should tell, tell. And then, yes, strategically add what you must add back in to do it well. But huge caveat here. Don't be afraid to use more data. There is a place for simplicity, but more data. Your audience can handle it. As an example, I did a survey, asked 1,000 people to rate a product on a scale from 1 to 5. The median score was 3.8. Eh mildly interesting. They kind of like it. Okay. Tell me more. All right. How about this? 400 people love the product. They gave it a five. Everybody else, same median score or this 400 people hated the product. Same median score. These distribution diagrams show me more data, but look at the design. Incredibly simple. Still the same one label, same, the same number is popped forward, but you're showing, you're, you're respecting me enough to show me the data, which tells me a lot. The nuance is there for me to see more. And if, that, if the story is, is, um, requires and or enables this type of insight, do it. Don't be afraid to, to allow your audience to see that complexity. One last thing about design and visualization best practices is it's absolutely also about the charts you pick. Individual charts do different things well. There are cheat sheets like this one that we'll talk about more in the class that help you pick the right chart for the task at hand. You don't see a pie chart if you want to communicate correlation. So you would never use a pie chart for correlation. You would never use uh, you know, a box plot distribution diagram to show part to whole relationships. Different charts do different things. Don't just pick charts willy nilly. You pick them for a reason. So just do it. Really, this is what it's all about. Do it with intention. Intentionality is the most important thing for this entire discussion. Intentionality around the data you pick, around the analysis you do and how you do it, the questions you ask your data, all the way through to the storytelling and the visualization and even the chart selection and those design decisions. Intentionality is your friend. Do things for a reason and everything you do gets better. So I have some examples to share, but we are low on time. I do want to save time for questions, but let me share two, one, two uh, very, very, very quickly. I love this example. This just, just came out literally like a week ago visualizing the biomass of life. And so this is looking by weight and each little cube represents some amount of biomass, 1 million metric tons of carbon is how they're measuring this. And arthropods make up this much of the, by weight of the biomass around the world. World Fish make up this much. Annelids and mollusks and da 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 da, -da all the way down to wild birds and somewhere down way at the bottom in there, Somewhere in here is humans, which is maybe a smaller 
value than you might expect. Yeah, humans are over here. And so it's just such a cool way of visualizing that data and telling a very, very simple story, segmenting it, beautifully designed, not that simple. Like this is not like the do less from a design standpoint, but this is so much do less from a storytelling standpoint in a very effective, good way. Um, there are other examples here. If you want to check this one out on your own, go for it. If you look up Roger Federer, 20 years, 20 titles, really good data storytelling, journalistic piece with good, consistent, and yet somewhat innovative use of data visualization throughout. Very long journalistic piece, definitely worth checking out. And then this final one, looking at the murder rate in Honduras, you could, you're supposed to take the magazine, uh, the page out of the magazine, this is in The Economist, tack it up in the wall and throw a dart at it. And your odds of being murdered if you were a man in Honduras in 2012 were the same as the odds of hitting this red rectangle over here compared to the United States, compared to Singapore. So I can look at the numbers, 1 in 599 compared to 1 in 13,000, 256,000, whatever. Yeah, that's a much bigger number. Okay, but I don't feel that. I feel this. I could hit this easily by mistake with a dart. There's literally no chance ever of hitting this little tiny pixel. Like, no way. You cannot be murdered if you're a man in Honduras in 2012. Like, literally almost impossible. So this is a very, very effective data story, two paragraphs, and extremely well visualized. But it's a bunch of rectangles. Who couldn't pull this off? You don't need to be, you know, Van Gogh to, to create a designed experience like this. So... I know that was like rapid fire. My goodness, that was so fast. Um, but I'm very excited to answer questions for you all about the ideas here, the thinking, data storytelling, visualization, the class, really uh, anything that you like. So awesome. whew, I'm going to pause there. I know. Take a deep breath, Bill. That was amazing. Thank you so much. Just... And I, I do want to follow up with a question because I think about the things that you were talking about is, is know what you want to communicate, know your audience. And... Mm -hmm. I feel like that can apply, you know, we're talking about data analytics, but that can apply to so many different positions out there and so many different careers. And I have seen yeah. that people are drawn yeah. to, you think GIS certificate, right? You think, oh, I don't know if I'm interested in geospatial information, but the, the application of some of the pieces in this certificate program can work across so many different disciplines. Have you found yeah. that's true, that yeah. this kind of information and the GIS specific and data visualization can, can really apply to a variety of different careers? The phrase that I always use is that nowadays, literally every role in literally every organization, they say, you know, of office worker, not necessarily if you're a barista at Starbucks, maybe you're not doing data viz, but pretty much every other role plays with data. You have to look at data and put together PowerPoint presentations with that data and explain stuff to your boss based on data. So yeah, every single role. Um, GIS, slightly less so for sure. I mean, clearly not everybody is working, creating complicated maps in ArcGIS, but even, even most roles, you're, you're making presentations where you do touch on location-based information and maybe population density might be related to the story you're telling, et cetera. So, yeah, I mean, even even with mapping, which is a little bit more of a specialty, um, just about every role needs to th at least think geographically if they're not communicating with it. But yeah, on data viz more broadly, no question about it. Yeah, absolutely. And and I wanted to reference too. I believe it was Jessica that said a few minutes ago that she um, has a good grasp of data literacy thanks to the Master Public Health Program. And so you're seeing the the need for this in so many different disciplines, which I think is is awesome that we're offering this course. And I'm so excited that you're on our team to be able to present this. Um, and so I'm going to ask Kelly on our team to put up a link to the GIS Professional Certificate um, uh, link on their website that shows when. Um, the data visualization bills course is happening. We are hoping that we're going to be launching another one in the spring, but we are also thinking there'll be one in the summer. So we could have Bill teach probably every other week, um, but he's got other things on his plate. So, but keep an eye on that program page to see when the courses are offered by Bill. Um, and Bill, we do have a couple questions. So let's just take a few minutes. Sure. Um, sure. Sarah asks, what's your favorite program to design in? Hmm. That's a good question. So I do um, mostly fairly custom work. And so when I create visualizations for client projects, I tend to work in, uh, if I'm doing an interactive or, or animated experience, I'm using D3, which is a JavaScript programming library for producing the final thing. 
Um, and I do a lot of design work in Adobe Illustrator. So I'll start from, you know, really from scratch, creating, you know, geometric shapes and all that kind of stuff. That being said, uh, depending on the type of visualization I'm creating, I also frequently might create a simple chart in, say, Excel, and then pull that into Adobe Illustrator to stylize it and, and change literally how it actually comes across. The chart that I showed earlier of um, that we walked through all the, all the FNO steps, um, yeah. that was a chart created in Excel, brought into Adobe Illustrator just to sort of make some of those design uh, updates to it. Yeah, So perfect. Yeah. So sometimes start in something simple and then bring it over to add some pizzazz, I suppose. Um, Jeffrey yeah. asks, given the amount of COVID-19 data that we're all seeing, what do you think public health officials are doing well in their communication strategies or where could there be some improvements? Oh boy, that is no such a good question. One. So <laughs> tough, I know. Uh, what are they doing well? Well, listen, the fact is that how often do public health professionals have to capture and report at the scale and the speed that they have to be doing right now um, in order to keep people informed about what's going on around them. Um, just the, the, that alone is an incredible feat. And the fact that it's being able to be, you know, sort of aggregated by people like Johns Hopkins and, and others who have done an insanely great job of that. So I'm sure there are a hundred other things that they're doing well, but I'm not as in touch with what they're doing on the data side. Um, I think clearly where there could be improvement is around the communication. And listen, there are certainly audiences that are resistant to the ideas. And no matter what you do, you're not going to be able to reach those people with some of the communication. I think also there have been plenty of missteps around the communication. And by the, by the way, the most recent example, which I don't know if it's the fault of public health professionals so much as it's the fault of the news media, um, who, of course, acts as translator for those public health professionals. But like, what was the story that came out yesterday? The U.S. has surpassed the total deaths of uh, from COVID compared to the 1918 flu epidemic. Yeah, yeah. yeah that's true. That is a, as an absolute number. That is totally true. However, our population size has tripled. So we're actually, right. it's nowhere near as bad as that proportionally. And so I didn't see a single, of, certainly on, on the you know, general media coverage that even acknowledged that. And again, it doesn't mean to, to diminish the number on its own because it is a shocking number and we should have done way, way, way better. But there have been a lot of things like that where I think that some of the context has been missing from the data, where a little bit more context and a little bit more of a thoughtful strategic approach to the communications maybe would have helped with the, maybe the 10% in the middle that might have been movable, you know. But, you know, we all know the, at the spectrum, at the ends of the spectrum, some people can't be moved no matter what you do. Right. Yeah, no pressure on answering that question. That was a that was a great one and, and a heavy question. Thank you, Jeffrey. Um, and John Walker, sure. I wasn't sure, um, Bill. John was asking the 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 chart that you showed, the visual that you showed, the various different um, types of graphs and charts that would be applicable to different things. Is that something that you created for the course, or is that something that people could find that we could share? This is something you can find. So the URL for it is at the bottom of the screen there. Um, that's a shortened we'll URL. We'll share that. Um, but this is... We can share that out yeah. in the follow-up. Yep, we'll share that out in the email follow-up. So I'll make sure to follow up with you, Bill, on that. Um, but that's a great question. And thank you for showing that. And thank you for sharing it. Yeah, of course. Looks like Alexandra is yeah. typing one question. So I just want to give just another minute here to let Alexandra um, fill in that question. Um, Bill, I, I have a follow-up question while we're letting Alexander type. Um, so we've gone not quite a year, I think, of having you teach the data visualization courses, or maybe we're coming up on a year. What, what have you yep. enjoyed about teaching courses through the University of Vermont? I love it. I, you know, I love teaching generally, and you know, I love speaking about the topic. So just on, you know, just from the base uh, standpoint, it's, it's always going to be fun for me. Um, I do love all the interaction with the students uh, where I get a chance to. It's an asynchronous online course, so it's not like in-classroom interaction. Um, but when I am grading, giving feedback, and I'm getting emails back and forth, and the the few live sessions that we do, um, it's a lot of fun because the there's a couple things about it. First of all, getting to work with uh, college students, undergrads, which I have not had much experience with in the past, this is great. Uh, the diversity of the students because it's undergrads and grads and continuing ed all in one class. So there's a really a lot of um, it's like a great melange of ideas uh, just amongst the the group. Uh, and the fact that you have, you know, age range, experience range, and all that stuff, is just super fun and interesting. So um, I love everything about it, to be perfectly honest. And I love That's having awesome my Vermont thing. swag. I have a Vermont t-shirt, which I love to wear around now. 
Well, we love you wearing your Vermont swag. Um, and Brian, I, I want to recognize what you said as well. I was thinking throughout the presentation that I don't think, and we've done a lot of webinars and info sessions and workshops here, and I don't think we've ever had um, one of our presenters say, blah, 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 um, F no, and had a baby eating ice cream <laughs> with, a, with a he or she's toe. So you take the cake on that one, Bill. That's the trifecta for, for every good presentation. Yes. You really did. You, you win the prize. So Alexander says, and we'll take this last question, and then we've got to get Bill to, on to another meeting. This is a specific program specific question, but if we already have GIS experience or other class and college, there's a way to test out certain courses of the program. I'm um, about to take my fourth GIS class for my own college curriculum and just wanting to know. Um, I, I don't know that we can test out courses, but why don't why don't you reach out? Um, Kelly, can you just put our email address? It's learn at uvm.edu, but Kelly will put it into the chat box reach out to us. Let's have you connect with one of our enrollment coaches. Um, maybe you could jump into one of the live sessions that Bill's talking about and, and just learn and see what's happening in the course. I'm not sure what the opportunities are to kind of, you know, look around and, and take a look, but um, our enrollment coaches will be able to answer that for you. That's a great question. Thank you so much for asking that. Um, Bill, I'm going to let you go. I know you got plenty of more charts and graphs and data visualization to create today. And our students, thank you so much for teaching in our data visualization communication course in our GIS professional certificate. And thank you everyone who participated and asked great questions. We hope that you are able to go from numbers to narrative. And we hope you have a wonderful afternoon. Take care, everybody. Thank you.